The Freedom Train that honors the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. will be making its annual trip from San Jose to San Francisco without the blessing of a key civil rights group. The San Jose branch of the NAACP is not supporting today's event after the train organizers accepted a $5,000 donation from the San Jose Police Officers Association. The NAACP says it was inappropriate in light of reports that San Jose police officers are more likely to use force against people of color. Proof once again as if you needed it that the NAACP is out for one thing, and that's their wealth and their continued power. Bringing people together would end their organization. Having the San Jose PD say, yeah, we've made a lot of mistakes, but we're trying to get better and we're with you in this. Well, that would diminish the NAAC's, NAACP's power. These activist groups, they're about dividing us so they can continue to profit. Never forget it, the phony balonies. I'm sorry, that was, a, that was harsh words. Phony baloney. I'm sorry if the kids were listening. We're going to play the entire Martin Luther King Jr. I Have a Dream speech coming up at 7.03. Have you ever heard the whole thing? Stay tuned. You're listening to The Armstrong and Getty Show. The Armstrong and Getty Show. I'm Jack Armstrong. He's Joe Getty. Howdy. Uh, it is a day off for a good chunk of people and not a day off for probably a bigger chunk of people. Um, for Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. When's his actual birthday? I don't know. That. I don't have the slightest idea. But um, in light of that, we are going to play the entire I Have a Dream speech. I'm going to start it at 7.03. It's about 16 minutes long. I don't know if you know the story on the speech, but, um, you know, they had like a million people there gathered on the mall in Washington, D.C. He was expected to give a humdinger, and uh, he gave his long written out text that he had crafted as a um, man with a Ph.D. in theology and a professor, etc., and mm-hmm. uh, left people a little uh, dry mouthed. Didn't get a lot of people moving. People just kind of standing around. And he thought, uh, a little applause here and there. I got to get this thing wound up. Yeah. So then he started ad libbing from a speech he'd given, I think, the week before in Detroit at a church. And he started ad libbing, and that's the part is the memorable part that everybody quotes all the time. Thank goodness he uh, did a little ad libbing. Heard he just walked off, and that would have been it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's funny how the, what the history hinges on. Yeah. What if he had decided, well, that's my prepared speech, and I gave it, and I'm going to walk yeah. off. Right. And it would just have been another speech on that day that uh, didn't get a heck of a lot of attention. Well, Perhaps. You know, I don't know. His product was an idea, and a, and a very, very appropriate idea. But you see where the product isn't necessarily enough. It's got to be about the salesmanship. you got to fire people up. Sure. you got to transfer enthusiasm. And and it wasn't happening. The first part of the speech I think you'll find interesting in a number of different ways. As I said before, it's a real snapshot of the issues and the people and, and the feelings of the time. And it makes some very nice arguments for why uh, there should certainly be racial equality in America. But then again, he, as Jack said, he didn't wind it up really toward the end. Am I correct? Uh, you've read the uh, great Cormac McCarthy stuff. I just have it secondhand. But that the Kennedy administration had looked over Cormac the speech. Cormac McCarthy. I'm sorry. The I guy who wrote the, wrong... the, the road. And... Oh, jeez. I'm sorry. I was just talking about him. What's his name? Uh, Dr. Seuss. No. Who wrote this, this trilogy? Taylor Branch. Taylor Branch. Exactly. Uh, anyway. You can read Cormac McCarthy. He's great, but you won't learn <laughs> much about Martin Luther King Jr. Do you damn, do you, anyway, so the Taylor Branch stuff. <laughs> Kennedy administration was pretty concerned about what was going to be said, and they had the text of the speech, right? And they knew more or less what was going to be said? Oh, that's right. There was a hell of a lot of wrangling between um, Martin Luther King Jr. and the and the and and Bobby and, and uh, JFK uh, over whether or not they were going to allow him to give the speech and what he could say. Uh, it, unbelievable. If you're going to assemble a million fired-up people on the National Mall, we're going to, for instance, not want you to call for immediate armed violence. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to make sure it wasn't too crazy. And uh, and I guess uh, people got pretty nervous when they realized he's departed from the text. He's gone rogue. Oh, yeah. The, the reality of politics is so much different than what a lot of people would like it to be. Martin Luther King wanted to have a meeting with John F. Kennedy, who is, you know, beloved in the black community. But John F. Kennedy would not meet with Martin Luther. They set up a situation once where they were going to have 
John F. Kennedy come out of his office and walk down the hall, and some other people were going to have Martin Luther King Jr. walking down a different hall so they could accidentally meet, and they'd have plausible deniability that they just happened to be in the building, and JFK happened to be going to the bathroom, and so saw him and said, hey, right. so that they could have any sort of contact whatsoever, right. because he couldn't let it be known that he had scheduled a meeting with Martin Luther King Jr., because he would lose the entire South. Right, right. But as you listen to the speech, there are a number of things to look for. Um one of the more interesting ones to me is is that uh, the very last part, the actual I have a dream stuff, which, again, was ad-libbed. Uh, have a dream that I could fly and wolverines were chasing me. Nope. It's not Different like speech. That. Different speech. But that's the famous part. It's like my feet were glued to the floor. That's the we can all come together and put our arms around each other and, and, and revel in the poetry and the beauty and the justice of it all. But there's a lot of, prior to that in the speech, a lot of... Calling out individual states. Mississippi, you're a hellhole. You're a burning hellhole wow. of racism. He doesn't say that. You're a hellhole. But <laughs> nice job, hellhole. <laughs> he's uh but he's calling out specific states for the racism. Uh pointing fingers and 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 talking plain about the injustice. And I think part of the danger is, and this happens so much with history, even recent history, is that we get kind of the broad outlines of it and the happy stuff we can all agree on. And we reduce these uh, these heroes of history, some of whom were a little dangerous at their time, were a little radical at their time and and hurt a lot of feelings and pissed a lot of people off at their time. We reduce them to some sort of universally accepted as noble good fellas. You know, in hindsight, and you forget, at the time, they seemed like they were a little out there. Well, that's what I'm talking about with the JFK couldn't meet with MLK thing. Right. Like, like if you want if you want gay marriage to be a thing, Barack Obama can't get elected saying he's for gay marriage. So Barack Obama's got to say he's against gay marriage. He might be for gay marriage, but he's got to say he's against... I mean, it's not as clear-cut as JFK was the leader of uh, civil rights and stood up for... Well, he kind of he wanted to, but he couldn't. Right. Well, as much as you'd have liked at the time, I'm sure. Right. But you look back on it in history, and it's just he's a leader, and he was willing to risk it all for whatever. Well, and you know the classic, classic case of that that people get wrong all the time, and I want to fight him for it is uh, Abe Lincoln and slavery. He, slavery sickened Abraham Lincoln personally to the core, and anybody who tells you differently knows just enough to be dangerous. He's trying to preserve the Union. That was his number one goal, and he found the politics of it incredibly difficult. Um, and, and so it was, you know, you got to just get an inch, get an inch, get an inch, get an inch, until, you know, the tides of history overtake or, or, or drown what you're trying to get rid of. But um, at the time, it was not kumbaya, arms around each other, everybody in, in agreement. It was dangerous. So, you know, listen to it in that context. So we have got the entire I Have a Dream speech coming up at a 7.03. We'll kick it off. We're going to have to break it into two chunks. It's fairly long. But like I said, if you tune out, if you find yourself getting bored and you listen to me, switch over to a music station, you're a racist. I Clearly. mean, just, just look yourself in the mirror. Say it out loud. I am a racist. I am a racist. I didn't listen to the whole speech. You know, one, I'm a bad person. One more thought about how to listen to it, because I can't trust you to do it on your own terms. Uh, there are also parts of it that are like, yeah, you said that two minutes ago. Is this building towards something? <laughs> uh. But there are nuggets within, even as he kind of is just treading, treading water, marching in place that are worth hearing. This is the Armstrong and Getty Show. I'm Jack Armstrong. He's Joe Getty. Thanks for tuning in. What was the date of the I Have a Dream speech? 1963, is that correct? I believe so. I don't know the date. What? I don't remember. Let's not get hung up on it. It was important. I don't know the date. It was 63, Washington, D.C. Everything was in black and white back then. Life was. Life was in black and white back then. Color was invented in the early 70s. So shall we... uh... Get to it. We're going to play the entire I Have a Dream speech from Martin Luther King Jr. 1963. And it don't have a date, though? I need to know the month and the day. I just, I need to know, is it fall? Is it is there a chill in the air? Am I hot and sweaty in June? Uh, I need to fully immerse myself in being there. I don't think we have time for immersion. <laughs> I think that could be come up with fairly quickly. Ladies and gentlemen... 
Well, yeah, no, it doesn't say. No, it's fine. Uh, it just says 1963. Mm-hmm. Apparently, the speech was that long. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 on August 28th, 1963. August of 63. Yeah. Here mm-hmm. it is. Here's what the people heard. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. 